In May 2024, against the backdrop of an impending general election and a generally disastrous time for the Conservatives, 107 metropolitan, unitary and district councils and 10 mayors will go to the polls. Ahead of polling day, we're hosting a series of conversations with council leaders who are currently running progressive coalitions. We want to shine a light on the realities of cooperation and look at the impact of their time in power. Joining us for this episode is Andy Graham, the leader of West Oxfordshire District Council. Andy, it's great to have you on. Um, I'm going to start by asking you, where are you and how are you? Oh, well, I'm really well. I'm here in Churchill, which is Churchill's a small village outside Chipping Norton. And I'm elected to represent Charlbury, Finstock and Fawler, which actually isn't where I live. But it's not where you live that counts. It's how much time you spend with the people you represent. So that's why I'm, I'm here as a district councillor and newly elected leader. And tell us a little bit about the history of that um, district council and the coalition in West Oxfordshire. When did it start and, and what are some of the key achievements that you've managed over the last few months? OK, well, we um, were formed two years ago and it was um, May 2022 and the Conservatives had lost control of the council for the first time in sort of 20 years or so. So there were 15 Liberal Democrats, nine Labour, I think it was, and it's two Greens. So that gave us a majority, um, uh, 26 out of the 49. And the, the Independents, I think, had three, and that left the Conservatives with 20. So that was, uh, the first job was to get together and actually see if one, we could work together, two, that we could marry up some of our key common ground issues and then actually work on that. So that's what we did. And um, it was quite easy to form it because we knew each other uh, somewhat. Most of us knew each other and there was a trust and there was a kind of confidence that we felt we had enough that was in common that we could work on. And so what we decided to do, and this I know will make some people laugh, but we decided that we put the main issues to the forefront. And that was about um, housing. We need homes um, and homes are what it's all about because that's what we all need. And we wanted to actually ensure that the, the uh, local plan, the new one, the emerging one, was far better than the one we inherited. And we wanted to put infrastructure first before homes so that we make sure that the quality of life is kind of reflected upon with homes, employment, and the kind of social infrastructure that actually makes us have a quality of life. So I kind of think those are the key things. And uh, to this day, we have worked together for two years. We increased our majority last year mm -hmm. um, as an alliance. We called ourselves the West Oxfordshire Alliance because that's what it is. Um, and we have not voted as an executive. Now, an executive is the sort of functions of, of government, if you like, of local government. And there are um, five Liberal Democrats, three Labour executive members and one Green. And we have not voted as an executive once in that time. And we have actually challenged and critically kind of put each other on the spot. But it's also about getting real results. And I think the advantages of an alliance, uh, some people call it a coalition, but we call it an alliance, is that you can have um, good debate, but you come up with the best results and you come by a general consensus and my job as leader, and I've only re really sort of got to know what the leader's role is over time, but I, I kind of think I'm a facilitator. And we delegate power. We delegate the way we actually make decisions. And it's on that trust and confidence and that integrity that really makes it work. And I can say to you, uh, you know, that all my political career, this has been the best two years of my political life. 
Wow. Wow. Stunned you into silence. <laughs> you did, yeah. <laughs> you stunned us into silence. Um, I think Luke's going to ask the next question. Thanks for that, Andy. Um, you, you might have touched upon this already. I think you have. Um, but the next question we wanted to put to you was, can you highlight a specific example of how working together has helped you achieve a better outcome? Um, and just to kind of add to what you've already said, it might be worth thinking of that in terms of kind of what might you not have achieved um, had you not been working together? I think in order to change a system, you have to change the way you look at things. And I kind of think that the whole way we've looked at things has made us, right, turn things upside down. Um, we've t- stretched it one way to the left, one to the right. We've actually sort of put it upside down. And we come up with, um, I suppose, on a lot of things, um, we probably wouldn't have achieved as much because you've got that layered thinking and you're not just stuck by political dogma. I think sometimes, and this is the reason why the country doesn't operate properly, is because dogma, you know, everyone falls back and you defend your position from a political point of view. And I think most people want a point of view which is kind of partly their point of view. And if they don't feel that we've engaged with them and we've understood and empathised, then we haven't done it at all. We haven't really been democratic. And so one of the things we have done as an alliance is we had a massive campaign on how we actually engage with uh, the community. We did a youth needs assessment. Three and a half thousand young people in, in West Oxfordshire actually engaged in a real consultation about the things that they wanted to see. And now we, as an alliance, have actually come up with the first youth development officer for West Oxfordshire. We don't have to do that. It's not part of our remit, but it is because, you know, it's one of the needs that that has come from young people and we're going to address rural um, access to activities and events in a rural area. Young people find it really difficult to get to those events. You can't be relying on parents or your you know, the people who you're looked after by just because they can take you in their car. That's not good for the environment anyway. So, you know, it's about addressing those issues. We've got um, the funds for it. We found the funds. We used money that the government had actually given us through the COVID um, difficulties. And we got some left over. It's called Conf money. And we've put it for young people. And then we've actually added to it and we've actually got a fund for young people which they can access, they can determine. And it's not just about voluntary organisations. They do a good job, don't get me wrong. But sometimes young people are missed out of voluntary organisations because they don't represent every aspect of youth culture. So now we're saying... There's funds there for young people and it doesn't matter if it seems a crazy idea. And, you know, you learn by your mistakes. So it's a fund that you learn by mistakes. Some of them will work, some of them won't, but you will be able to access it without actually thinking, I've got loads of forms to fill in, I don't know how to do it. We've got someone who will help to do that. So there's an example. Oh, I don't know if Lena's mic might have, have dropped off, uh, but thanks for that, Andy. I think Claire has the next question for you. So over to Claire. Hi, Andy. Um, I wondered if you could tell us something about what voters might say in the up and coming elections um, about the council and how you would encourage them to vote tactically at the next local elections. Um. I'm hoping that we've, we got the message through about the way we work. And, and I know that what I've heard is that, and why people actually voted for an alliance, was because they knew that the parties were going to work together. They knew that partnership working is what it's all about. And why is because that's how life is. 
we have to work together, whether it's with a group of friends or whether it's in your own families or your workplace. You have to work together. And so in a way, I think that's the that's the key. But then how do you do that? How do you sort of work out who to vote for? Because in the past, it's always been a minority that has actually represented the majority. Well, that to me just isn't fair. That's not equitable in any way whatsoever. So what I would say to people is, one, look at the candidate. Think, is that person going to actually really represent me? And are they going to put the time in? And also, what kind of values do they have? You know, do they care about climate, for example? Do they care about social value, about meeting the kind of deficit when it comes to social justice or economic justice? Are they the people that are going to help to find the funds that are going to make us sort of work together better? Um, are they the ones that really will count in that sense? And I kind of think sometimes you will find that even when you've got that, you might still have a bit of a contest there. But there's something that shows what's happened in the past. And whilst I say don't rely on the past because you've got to find change, you might think tactically in some areas, um, if we split the vote between common parties, the Tories will come back in. And... When the Tories come back in, I mean, you've got burnt toast. Why should everyone have burnt toast? They're the burnt toast. Because the reason why I say that isn't because um, I don't like toast, I do. <laughs> but it's just that burnt toast is awful. And you chuck it in the bin and it needs to be in the bin because, you know, it's been left and no one's looked after it. So what I say is um, make sure that we don't go back there because they sit on their hands, they spend nothing and actually do nothing. And it's just like, if nothing changes, everyone gets fed up. Everyone feels as if, why should we go out to vote? And this is a good reason to go out to vote because we can together change things. And I tell you, and this is the honest truth, Claire, I gave up my job to become leader of the council. I get £20,000 a year as leader and I get 5000 for being a councillor and my sum's salary is 25000 Now I think I'm one of the low earners in this country, in this district. 25000 is not a lot of money and I know some people earn a bit less than that but I tell you I put in five days a week, five evenings a week and why do I do it? Because my partner says to me, why are you doing that? And I said, it's about legacy. It's about not what you do for yourself. It's what you leave for the people who come after you. And I genuinely believe that. I really do. And I will get my emails out. I will do them 24 hours. You'll get a reply. Even if it's a crazy request, you'll get a reply. And, you know, I won't let you down. And I say to all councillors and people I work with, I said, look, don't let anyone down. Do your best and put in as much as you can. Not everyone's like me and takes the same view. But I kind of think you've got to be dedicated and committed. So, you know, go out and vote because that's what I hope you will be voting for. Thanks, Andy. Uh, on that, do you think, I mean, one of the things that we've run into a lot at the local elections in particular is that there's just very low turnout consistently across the country. Um, and you've talked a little bit about the ways you're engaging young people normally who don't vote at local elections. But do you see that as a massive problem for councils, that low turnout? Or do you think there's a bigger problem facing councils at the moment in England? Well, I think we've always seemingly had low turnout, particularly in local elections, but you sometimes have low turnouts in general elections as well. Um, and I think people do have the right to say, I'm not going to vote. I just prefer you to go out and say you're not going to vote. Put it on a ballot paper, I'm not going to vote. But at least you've made the effort to say it, because otherwise you're leaving people to guess 
But if you proactively go out and vote, I kind of think it shows that you care about the services and the community you live in. Um, and don't be put off by the negativity that is around at the moment. There's a lot of negativity around, and it does put people off. Um, but I say, you know, you are better than that. If you're negative, that's their problem. It's not your problem. They're trying to impose on you. You are much better than that. So I just say, rise above it. Um, some parties, and um, you know, they tell lies. They distort the truth. And it's really hard for you to know what is the truth. Um, but I would say, don't rely on one newspaper. Because one newspaper is influenced by the editors often. Um, and, you know, you need a range of um, outlets to see. Don't always believe in social media either. Because some of that is just like clickbait. It's like, uh, it's easy to say something and then you're off. Because you can turn the camera off. You can turn the messages off and and you're away. But what that can impact on someone who is more vulnerable is really unfair. So I think, think before you say and think before you write. And, um, you know, but go out there. Don't be put off by low turnout because you can make that a higher turnout. And that is more democratic. Mm -hmm. You know, get out there. We need the change. Well, that's what Claire's working on. Um, speaking of, um, we wanted to take, obviously we've been talking about the local picture and we're talking about West Oxfordshire a little bit, but looking towards a general election, how might progressive parties in your area build on the collaboration to try and get that vote out and try and inspire people and, and beat some of the negativity that you're talking about? Um, what sort of outcomes would you want to see in key target seats at, at a general election? Well, um, I, I know I'm just saying this, and I'm not saying it just because I'm a Liberal Democrat. I'm saying it because... I think this is the time for change. This is the change. And even if you think, I'm not sure that it's going to be better, I think what we do know is what we've got. And what we've got has divided people. It's made people less well off. Um, it's made people really feel bad, and they shouldn't feel bad. Why should they, you know? Um, and I kind of think there's possibilities of a future which is better for the environment it is better for potentially for your families or for your future careers uh, you know it's better for culture if we work and celebrate together and let every possibility happen don't forget it's your maximum potential reach it go out there do more you can do and I think in the general election there's possibilities like in Oxfordshire. Um, I think there's some great candidates out there, for one. I, I do believe, and I know that the Liberal Democrats came second in the Whitney constituency, but it's changed in the sense it's been sliced up and people don't understand how it's even sliced up. I mean, it's only been sliced up to get num num numerical sort of equality, but it does doesn't really pay any attention to identity in terms of how people feel about wh who they're with now. There's the Banbury, for example, Bang Banbury, Charlbury and um, uh, Chippy Norton, um, all great places. Um, it will change the demographics somewhat. And I think, you know, there are, I think if people look at it, Look at how people have voted locally, if that helps them to make sense of it, because it's new. Um, you'll get a sense of who's next best to really make that change happen. And if you look at Bister Woodstock and Ensham, that one, you'll see change there, which isn't the same necessarily as, uh, as Banbury, Charlbury, uh, um, uh, uh, up there in Chipping Norton. And then you've got the Whitney Carson, which has actually encompassed Farringdon now as well. And that will change as well. So I know all parties will say, oh, vote for, vote for us um, anyway. But I kind of think um, voters are a bit more discerning than that. 
and they can tactically see that actually in this instance, it did happen last time, and I think Labour voters supported the Liberal Democrat candidate in Whitney, and I, I think I think there was a uh, that is acknowledged and and gratefully received, and you know similarly we we kind of take a view, and I take a view on it that. Um, Parties will probably all in their HQ will say, just vote for the party. Um, and there's no deals and there's, they don't really advocate tactical voting. Um, but I would say, leave the voters to actually use their intelligence to discern what they feel is best. And one thing I can say is, and that's probably in common with a lot of alliance type party arrangements is we've had enough of the Tory rule and it is time now for change. And even Tories are saying our time is up. So, hey, what a thing. Let's go for it, folks. This is it. We're on it. Um, Claire, did you want to follow up with that at all? Given that you're the person running this campaign? Yeah, well, yes. I mean, that was fascinating. As you say, um, the demographics have, have changed because of the boundary changes in Oxfordshire. And I have spoken to constituents in various seats who now feel quite kind of alienated, you know, a bit sort of confused because of both that they're not in the same seat that they were in before and they're having to relearn the politics of their particular um, seat. So I think that's been tricky for people. But uh, I really pick up on what you say about the impetus needing to come from voters themselves because all the parties are constrained by what they're allowed to say. So it's really down to us as more non-partisan to encourage voters to try to get behind the best place party to um, remove the Tories. And uh, that's what we're working hard on at the moment. But it's been brilliant hearing your, your take on it. So thank you. Yeah, and I think just to add something up from the Compass perspective, the whole campaign that we're running at the general election is to change politics so that we don't have to do these deals and a kind of pacts or kind of agreements um, in a place that voters can't see them anymore. Um, people should be able to vote the way that they want, it, want to. And... Um, what we're asking is that people use their vote to support candidates who back changing the voting system so that uh, that can be the reality of all the voters and, and all voters are represented and listened to rather than just a small sliver of them. Um, I did want to ask Andy, we do have a question in here and it could be a bit controversial so you can you can feel free to not answer it. Um, right, go for it. Um, we're always, you, you've kind of alluded to it, but we're always working in that space between the national parties, between the HQ, the local parties and the voters. And we're kind of going in between those. Um, and there's real discrepancy, as you kind of alluded to, between what the messaging is that's coming out of national HQs of political parties and what we're seeing on the ground in terms of we run everywhere, there's no deals. And that's just not true with what we've seen on the ground from all three parties. So how, from your specific party, how do attitudes locally differ from those at Party HQ? Have you and your coalition partners experienced pushback when forming um, alliances or working with other parties? Like what is the internal politics of doing this wider project as a Lib Dem? Gosh, you probably got it in one when you said internal politics, really. <laughs> it's going on behind the scenes and sometimes, you know, things get done not because it's a lack of transparency, but because there's a sensitivity that's attached to it. So I kind of feel that if I was to say everything that I knew that was going on behind the scenes, I would that I might upset people who yeah. had almost kind of trusted me not to say certain things. Yeah. But it's not trans a lack of transparency. It's, it's the sensitivity that um, is held on that. And... And so I respect that. And I, all I can say is, is that if West Oxfordshire is a, is a template, look how well we have actually worked together. 
and I will defend my Labour colleagues, I will defend my Green colleagues equal to that of the Liberal Democrat colleagues in that alliance, because I genuinely believe that all of us, whatever the party, we came together and showed the strength of purpose and focus and we had the commonality of our residents at heart. And that's exactly the same when it comes to voting. They are the ones that come first. And we know the politics is there, but we use that as a measure for the electorate to say, I actually like those policies. I don't like all of them, because I think it would be mad if everyone looked liked everyone's party politics in terms of each party. Even I don't actually agree with everything in my party. And there's things where I have... But on the balance of things, I think those are the ones I generally feel closest to. And I think a lot of Labour colleagues will say the same and, and, the, and Greens likewise. And listen, we didn't need to have a Green um, representation numerically, even proportionately, in, in the alliance. But I kind of thought it's about having that sort of added value that they brought. And I think that's really more important than just saying, oh, it's a simplest proportional representation. I think we can go better than that. And I think it's about getting that sort of layered view across and you don't have to always kind of be simplistic about it. You know, go for the quality of democracy, not just democracy itself. Yeah, we often hear that um, sometimes cooperative politics is lowest common denominator politics. <laughs> yes. And in practice, every time we've ever looked into it or worked in it or asked anyone, it's the opposite. Um, we, one of the councils that um, one of our local groups has been involved in in Surrey uh, is suing the government and looking to, or has a good chance of de deposing the sitting chancellor. That, that is not lowest common denominator politics and, and um, small thinking. It's really big stuff and it comes out of that cooperation. Yeah, I think we we kind of have learned and I've, I, I put to West Oxfordshire because everyone thinks, oh, it's an affluent place and, 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 and maybe generally a statistics and simplistic looking at the data maybe is but actually there are pockets of deprivation and deprivation is the same for everyone who who experiences wherever you are because it's very personal and you feel it and I think we have to give it dignity um, and respect for those who haven't got the voice and for those that need the support and advice in order for that to change for them. And and I kind of feel that in West Oxfordshire, we were the sleeping giant under the Tories. We've woken up and actually the giant is the sum of the parts. And that means our community is in partnership with us. And that's what I advocate. And one of the things I've done with, with my colleagues is we changed a, cha a council chamber. We invested in it because the last council chamber, which the Tories had, was a fixed seating, so it couldn't be used for anything else but a council chamber. You know, it's a bit like a museum that people sit in, and occasionally they, the gargoyles are on the wall in, with paintings of past chairs and past politicians looking down on them. And I kind of thought, is this really representative of our community? Mm. And how come it's only used 10% of the year and 90%, it's just like gaining cobwebs. And yeah. I thought, we've got to change this. So we we actually did change it. We even got a grant to bring the technology in. And now it's a community space, mm -hmm. number one, so that the community can use it 90% of the time and the council only uses it 10% of the time. And isn't that a better way of actually utilising an asset that belongs to the people? And a shopping centre we bought from a investment company that wasn't even in this country, a pension investment, and we bought it for half the price they actually bought it for. And now we shape the offer for our town centre. 
we can actually then decide who our local traders are. We can actually create our own community events because it belongs to us. And we, as councillors, are just the stewards of those, of those investments. They belong to you. The council space now belongs to the community as it rightfully should. And the council chamber facility is only 10% of the time, which is rightfully the right way of looking at it. So you have to change things and, like I said earlier, turn things upside down, stretch it one way and another, see which is a better fit and don't just sit in the past. Are there any more questions from Luke or Claire? And if not, I have one last one and then we can wrap up. No questions from me. That was really, really fascinating, Andy. And I think one of the things that really comes across, which we um, we talk about a lot at Compass when we talk about electoral reform and cooperation, is that um, a lot of the time uh, with kind of backroom deals and electoral packs and things like that, it's cooperation for kind of the wrong reasons or cooperation just out of necessity. Uh, but some of the things you've spoken about, for example, making sure that the Green Party is represented on your executive, that really uh, is it's the flip side of that, the, the side that we want to see more often, uh, which is cooperation for the right reasons and cooperation because it allows you to do so much more. So thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah. All right, cheers. Claire? All right. <laughs> to come off mute yes. Got yeah it. No, i just wanted to say that i loved your sleeping giant metaphor because i think that really brings out the kind of hidden power of these alliances that just need to be uh, woken and created so i hope that can be a, a theme perhaps for the rest of this series um thank you hey can i leave you just with one part in shot because I, I kind of saw this film called Wonka recently. I think you know it's been on and around. And one of the kind of quotes from the film which really touched me was when Willy Wonka was um, about to sort of start off the factory, because, of course, the latest one is before he gets the chocolate factory, and his mother who died and left him a message. And the message was, it's not the chocolate that counts. It's who you share it with. And I kind of thought, God, how prophetic. And I thought, that's exactly what it's all about, isn't it? So, you know, and I thought, yeah, I'll use that one. Yeah, you can say it's not the council that counts, it's who you share it with. <laughs> yes. Lena, you give me that one. I'll use you it. You can have it. You can have it. It's yours. Um, just so partly for a sound bite, but also partly to leave us on a nice hopeful note. Um, last question is, what is one thing that you're hopeful about for the upcoming year? Um, the upcoming year is uh, a new government and also a more collaborative, uh, developing partnerships, both in this um, Oxfordshire wide, but also in the country and beyond our boundaries, because really we've let down a lot of our friendships that existed in Europe and beyond those borders. And I think we just got to keep this working together, keep those partnerships going. And I think we'll actually be in a better world. Thanks, Andy.